level of um, training and uh, practical training that we were given. And then essentially over the next uh, year or so, um, we rolled out that basic SCAT team member training to all our operational response personnel. And that's over 100 people um, currently that are trained in, in basic uh, SCAT techniques. Um, and now we run those kind of uh, SCAT training courses all around the world at conferences and at uh, training courses and locations uh, for our memberships uh, worldwide. Worldwide, and it took around it took around two years to build our capability up from that initial training with uh, with Ed Owens. So, um, following that, we've also developed with our own internal uh, geomatics team, our own GIS team. We we looked at how we were gathering SCAT data in the field, which traditionally is on a paper based form, um, and we wanted to digitise that. So. With our own GIS team, we developed um, over the course of about a year or so a digital SCAT app that uh, is housed on uh, an Esri GIS platform, um, and that's collected um, digitally in the field with a ruggedized tablet or a, a phone in a case, um, which um, gives us a, a much quicker um, data collection to um, visualization on, on a common operating picture back in the command center. So it's a much uh, quicker way of transiting data from A to B, from the field to the command center. Um, we, fortunately, we don't have any time to demo that, uh, that app today, but we're happy to show anyone who's interested, just, just let us know. It is an internal OSRL tool only. It's not for resale, um, but we're happy to share uh, some of our uh, findings and knowledge and, and, and demo that. And we, we also developed it in parallel with ExxonMobil um, in the UK, who, were, who developed a very similar tool with their own in-house um, Esri uh, capability. Um, we've also, in the last few years, uh, produced a large range of internal SCAT and shoreline response guidance and forms and process. And the reason we've done that is to ensure that we maintain a high degree of quality and consistency during our response operations. And, and these are now controlled documents on our on our management system that our response personnel refer to um, on every on every spill. So they're using consistent uh, documentation and outputs with the process and with the scatter. Um, so before I hand over to James, I just wanted to mention uh, something else, which is the Shoreline Response Program that some of you may or may not have heard about. And it's a model that was uh, born out of the uh, 2010 Macondo incident, um, and it's been further re refined and developed over the, over the last few years. Um, now, it's the subject of a soon to be published IP guidance document. And it really is, is a lens that we use to focus our own shoreline operational excellence through. Um, so I would encourage you to look out for that document that will come out on the IOPICA website in the next uh, next few weeks. And essentially, the Shoreline Response Program provides a, a robust and focused uh, framework to manage, coordinate and streamline um, shoreline response planning um, for treatment and cleanup from the start of the response um, to the completion of those treatment operations. So it tries to bring in a lot of different operations within an incident command um, under one um, coherent uh, package. So um, if you've got any interest at all in shoreline response, I would encourage you to, to look out for that uh, publication. And James, later on in this uh, webinar, will discuss some of the existing shoreline um, response uh, documentation that IPICA have developed. So. Um, on that note, I'll hand over to James um, and I'll take any questions at the end. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for joining and giving up your time to attend the webinar. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's James Story. Um, I've been with Oil Spill Response now for nearing 10 years. The uh, majority of my time spent in the response department, attending numerous spills, exercises, training, etc. around the world, um, having fantastic experiences working alongside our members, supporting you in your time of need. Um, 
in the last few years, I've been recent, been lucky enough to be uh, a part of and deliver our advanced responder course or offline training, as some of you may know it, um, and have strived to continuously develop the course to get the best entry platform to the industry. I find myself now as the recently elected chair of the Shoreline Core Group. Uh, I'm team leader for one of the response teams and also duty manager. So it may well be me at the end of the phone if you call through for an exercise or an actual incident. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time just going through the rest of the members that build up the team, make up the team. Um, so we've got two discipline mentors, Rob Holland, you've already heard from. Um, second one is Paul Foley. I'm sure many of you are aware of Paul. Paul is the EMEA Regional Response Manager um, and has con contributed towards numerous publications and industry projects, uh, mo most notably recently as the Tier Protect Preparedness and Response Capability Wheel or TPR wheel, which you may know it as, and we will touch upon that a little bit later on. Uh, myself as chair, and then we've got three very knowledgeable, experienced contributors that have joined us. So Amasan is our geomatic specialist, uh, and is also our ArcGIS wizard in-house. Uh, he bring, brings with us a background of designing and deploying in-field data collection applications from various industries. Uh, Tom Munson is currently working on preparedness projects within our consultancy department. Uh, as well as his background in disaster management, Tom spent his previous life as an RNLI lifeguard, uh, managing teams to ensure the public safety across one of the busiest beaches on the south coast of England. So with that, he brings a, a fresh approach as to how and what we consider safety when dealing with shoreline responses. Tom Gillespie. Tom started, uh, he joined a hospital response as a work experience student from school uh, and then later joined us as a, a, an apprentice eight years ago. Uh, he's gained his mechanical engineering qualifications and has worked through to his current position as a response specialist. Uh, Tom has a very practical outlook on things and is starting to shadow a mass and learning and developing applications for use in response. So that's the team. Uh, it's a whole host of knowledge from different skill sets uh, that are all working towards common goals. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time now explaining our objective. Oh, someone's not on mute. Apologies, there's a bit of feedback. If you could all just mute for the time being, please. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So, yeah, just going to spend a little bit of time explaining our objectives um, and what developments and innovations are actually being explored within them. So, first of all, is our volunteer program. Um, with volunteers, we recognise that uh, to conduct any scale of shoreline cleanup requires a vast amount of people power. Um, we can obviously commit our service level agreement of 18 personnel towards a response if required, um, but realistically, it's going to require far more than that. Um, and we feel there'd be far more value in being able to connect with other agencies, oil spill response organisations, OSROs, and other oil spill service providers in peacetime to establish these relationships and common expectations. Uh, we're looking to build a, a network that we can tap into should the need, need arise to quickly force multiply and leverage any sort of local knowledge and be able to cover far greater areas in less time if we're looking for, to conduct such things as shoreline surveys, for example. Using Tom Munson's background of coastline safety, like I mentioned, his previous life as a RNLI lifeguard, we're looking to produce a framework around the safe and efficient utilisation of, of volunteers on a shoreline response. Uh, Tom will be picking up some, some great work that's already been conducted on previous iterations of the, of the shore group, shoreline core group, um, and he's going to develop an, an induction process that can be delivered to volunteers on a spill site. He'll be considering all the necessary requirements, such as any previous experience or training, physical capability, and how we can effectively get them up to speed with our processes and create some tangible outputs to feed straight into our IAPs, for example. Um, we'll be closely following the guidance set out um, in the PICA Joint Industry Project Good Practice Guides, or GIP GPGs, as you may know them, and uh, Rob related to earlier. Um, and we'll also be looking to test this process 
later this year uh, on a global shoreline exercise in Southampton, uh, COVID restrictions dependent. So again, please monitor the website for the release of those dates. Another objective is defining a good shoreline response. So we looked at this and we, we thought, what does a good response look like? Uh, Tom Gillespie will, will tackle this one, um, and it comes with a whole suite of concepts based around what a good shoreline response looks like. Uh, the area will cover everything on, what we do on a shoreline, from how we stake or secure our booms to the beach, to how we collect and display our data within a mobile instant combined post. Um, Tom's already started on some great work digitising our site entry protocols and site response plans, and they're going to be fed into a, a response dashboard that will be accessible to IMTs and EOCs, as well as the responders in field on their mobiles. Uh, this will all be produced under the same Esri ArcGIS software, as, as Rob mentioned earlier, that the SCAP app is on. So we've got some good experience of, of the, the usability of it. Um, this is one of our opportunities where we're going to be looking to collaborate with another core group, um, the visualisation one in this instance, to explore how we can monitor the progress of a response and help to target and enhance the recovery operations using such items as, as uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs and aerostats. So the next objective, the one that gets all the attention all the time, um, and quite rightly so, is the Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique, or SCAT, as you may know it. Um, Amasan's background naturally leans towards taking on the review of, of this objective. Um, it consists of reviewing our current SCAT app and abilities and capabilities within that. Um, and most recently, we've learned that from responses that the way in which SCAT app, we use SCAT, SCAT has evolved. Um, a big realisation has been that despite its name, shoreline cleanup assessment technique, how adaptable SCAT is, and being able to apply the same methodical cleanup assessment technique to inland and cold weather environments, for example. Understandably, with each of these environments comes their own bespoke parameters and challenges in which to assess against. And obviously the STRs, shoreline treatment recommendations, or perhaps just the TRs now um, that are produced are going to vary greatly. So another approach we are looking to explore is how to create a 3D perspective of an impacted site. So spilt oil isn't always going to be on the ground. Um, if, if a product has been released at any sort of pressure, it's likely to impact the upper to mid, mid to upper canopies of vegetation too. Uh, this is again where we look to collaborate with another core group. Um, in this instance, it will be the inland core group to help develop the process further. Uh, another part of the development of SCAT is going to be uh, where our guest speaker Paul Bunker comes in um, and the service that we have recently operation operationalised in a memorandum of, of understanding with canine Chiron in utilising dogs to detect oil. Um, I'll leave Paul to, to, detail, to, to detail it further. Um, but that's where we're looking to work with the inland core group um, as well to determine how we actually deal with the submerged oil or, or traces that dogs may detect um, and looking into ground remediation processes. Uh, one of Hamasan's goals is to increase our internal geospatial awareness uh, so that more of us can actually understand the true power and, and capabilities of platforms such as ArcGIS. So operational excellence, um, this is key to all of this, really. Uh, when we originally sat down, we, we did name it as its own objective. Um, but what we later discovered is that actually all of our objectives are encompassed within this simple phrase. Um, and that's, that's what we do. It, it's how we continuously improve, continuously improve that, that gold star service to our members. Um, take all of the work on SCAT, for example. This is not done, like Rob said, for any commercial gains or opportunities. It's purely to improve our capabilities and give, that, give back that, um, that value back to you, the members. Um, I've mentioned collaborat collaboration a few times now, um, and that's, that's no accident. Uh, it's also in line with one of our annual strategic review objectives, looking at beyond the horizon. Um, but it also just conveniently fits in so naturally with what we're all actually trying to achieve. So, as I touched upon 
earlier with the joint industry practice, uh, good practice guides. Um, ERSRAIL have, have been influential towards the development, development of these guides, as Rob alluded to earlier. Um, and a link to, to the website to, uh, to download these can be found in the chat pane. Um, just a little hint on that when you go onto the website and uh, you try to download the documents, you don't necessarily have to fill in all of your details. That You can just put in your uh, industry type. Um, but this sort of collaboration is exactly what we want to maintain. It's, it's how we work with industry to, prov to provide best practice guidance and implement them when we respond. Um, it provides, provides solid foundation for each category. As Rob mentioned, we're, we're, we are expecting the imminent release of the, the Shoreline Response Program from IPICA as well, which will then become the basis of how we take the next step forward. When we talk of operational excellence, we refer back to the, the tier preparedness and response capabilities wheel, like I mentioned earlier, uh, or, or TPR as you may know it. Um, if you're not familiar, the, the, you know the, the image on the screen shows how for each segment, uh, it's color coded in terms of uh, capability within that region. So ultimately, that within Shoreline alone, that counts three of the 15 segments. Um, so what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to do is, is grow the gray, grow that gray area, um, which represents the tier three. So we want to build on that tier three capability in which we offer our members. One of the solutions to increase that tier three capability under the segment of SCAP uh, is in to introduce a service that's provided by Paul Bunker. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Paul to explain it a little bit further. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to play you a video to give you an opportunity to understand what is consist what that consists of. Chiron K9 is the world leader in oil detection K9 capabilities. Backed by robust, independent research, successful field deployments, and state-of-art training facilities. The facility includes a 12-arm odor carousel, custom with target sample barcodes, climatic conditions, and video capture capability. Chiron K9 has over 70 subsurface target training pipes in a specially constructed training, research, and certification area. The subsurface target area provides the capability to conduct detection training from ranges of 1, 2, 3, 5, and 15 feet. Canines are imprinted to a minimum of 14 hydrocarbon-based products, including gasoline, diesel, light, medium, and heavy crude oils, ranging from fresh to heavily weathered. The teams can be utilized in spill response and pipeline integrity surveys. Teams can be deployed to shorelines, inland waterways, railways, urban areas, and pipeline right-of-ways. The team is trained to thoroughly and rapidly cover extensive areas to locate odor plumes or imprinted targets, using wide area search patterns for the rapid evaluation of large areas for surface or subsurface target materials, offering high-confidence, low-risk survey in which the canine searches independently off-leash has sufficient and appropriate direction from the handler to ensure complete coverage of the survey area, can work at a ground survey speed in order of five kilometers per hour, three miles per hour, or more in favorable conditions, utilizes GPS collar to data collect canine and handler tracking as well as waypoints of alert. The canines are independently certified to International Canine Spill and Leak Detection Association standards. The handlers are OSHA 40-hour, first aid and CPR trained and additionally experienced in GPS and data collection. Research and field deployments have proven Chiron K9 oil detection K9 teams as an effective, efficient, and cost-saving capability. For further information about K9 oil spill and pipeline leak detection capabilities, contact Chiron K9 today. Thank you, um, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about the oil detection canine capability. I'll give you a little background to start us off. Uh, first of all, I am the owner of Chiron Canine. It's a canine consultancy, and I am a trainer. And as part of that, I offer oil detection canine services, both in research and operational deployments. Um, I've been professionally trained dogs for 35 plus years. Started in the Royal Army Veterinary Corps 
and uh, served 22 years, and during that time did some specialised detection programmes, which brought me to the United States on completion of service. I've been here around 16 years, and during that time established specialised detection programmes for various government agencies and worked in the research and development of canine capabilities, specifically looking at detection, nutrition, hydration, cognition, um, and the more defined aspects of detection where we're trying to understand why dogs do what. And then in um, two and a half years ago, I decided to start my own consultancy, Chiron Canine, and that's where I am today. Looking at the actual oil detection program within that, back in 2015, Ed Owens, who Rob had already mentioned, wanted to look at the capabilities of canines to actually support SCAT operations and see if they could firstly detect uh, hydrocarbons within the environment and then could they integrate into a SCAT operation. So in July of that year 2015 API the American Petroleum Institute funded a research trial and this was to look at can dogs detect subsurface oils to three feet or one meter and can they cover large areas of ground effectively and efficiently to a defined detection standard. That was the actual research trial was a complete success and in 704 buried targets the canine teams detected 703 so there was one target missed out of all those that were hidden. Following that the teams was deployed up to Nova Scotia um, in May of 2016 for a field trial however this time it was on a actual spill so there'd been a ship that went down the Arrow in the 70s and it would remain subsurface offshore and it had a burp late 2015 and some oil, some bunker sea oil had actually washed upon shore and they wanted to see how the dogs operated within a real life environment. So we travelled up there six months later, it overwintered in the May of 2016 and worked the dog looking primarily for the oil that had burped up six months previous. And the team worked a number of beaches, both beaches where it was known there was oil and beaches where it was known there was no oil. And in fact, the dog found not only the oil from the six month burp, but it detected residual oils from the 1970s, and both subsurface and surface. So the capability was actually proven as a deployable capability, the integration into a SCAT response, and then it's an effectiveness within a field environment. And fortunately for us, um, not necessarily a fortunate incident, but fortunately for us, in August or late later that year, but in August of that year, we deployed a team up to uh, Saskatchewan in Canada following a pipeline burst that had gone into a river and the oil had gone downstream and it was quite a significant uh, incident. So we sent one dog up initially and then within two or three weeks, they requested another team just because the dogs were being so excessive. Uh, successful. However, that was the end of the survey period because up there the weather gets so bad you cannot conduct scout operations. So we did about two months of surveying. The dogs were hugely successful. We developed a off-boat handling technique where the dogs would search the riverbanks because they were high eroded bank and very difficult for humans to get onto. So the handler would actually sit on the front of a boat and handle the dog while the dog was going down the riverbank and when the dog responded then the team would uh, take the boat inshore and actually deal with the response. So moving into 2017 the teams were uh, taken or one of the teams was taken up to Prince William Sound in Alaska and the idea here was to evaluate the capability of the dogs to locate subsurface oil from the 1989 Exxon Valdez incident. And we went offshore to some of the islands in Prince William Sound, and the dog did in fact locate some of that sequestered oils from 20 years previous. And from there, we deployed immediately 
to uh, Saskatchewan with four teams for the full survey period throughout the summer. Um, and over the period of those four months, the four teams had over 8,000 confirmed fines of target oil. After that, then um, we went up each year to conduct follow on surveys um, based on the fact that over winter, the remaining oils would be redistributed and to follow the cleanup. Um, and since then, taken part in a number of research trials and deployments, both in the USA and in Canada. So our current understanding of capability um, through research is that the dogs can actually detect oils down to 15 feet or five meters. That, the results of that trial will be released in the near future. That was an API funded research trial um, independently run by Dr. Owens and um, some independent observers, including OSRL. And uh, the dogs were trialed to see if they could find heavily weathered Macondo products at 15 feet. Um, and as I said, the results of that trial will be released in the very near future. They were also trialed to see if they could find heavily weathered oils, Macondo oils, as well as variants like Dilbit um, and other types of weathered oils in comparison to fresh samples. And again, that's part of the trial that we released in the very near future from API. So we know the dogs can recognize changes in concentration of hydrocarbon products within the environment and then can lead you to the source. And they've proven capability to detect stain, cover, tar, oils and even oil in sediment underwater. And the photograph in front of you there is the Saskatchewan River up in Canada. Um, that's part of the response we were completing and actually some of the oils was underwater in the river and we have lots of examples of the dogs actually going out, wading out into the river and giving a response on the surface of the water. And when the SCAT response team went out and turned up the sediment, there was oil uh, sequestered within the sediment. So altogether, our program, uh, that is from when I started in 2015 with these dogs, they've had over 10,000 confirmed finds of um, oils. The detection rate to response, that is um, how much of the oil is actually verified as being present after a dog response is over 90%. So that means that out of every 100 responses that a dog gives, they've actually located, physically located target oils in over 90%, 90 of those cases. Now, some of the... <clears throat> Um, not necessarily an issue, but the dogs can actually locate oil by smell and it's really difficult for us humans to locate it visually. So that's one of the reasons why we're at just over 90 percent, not 100 percent, because if you imagine there in the incident of the oil being underwater in sediment, we can't recover that. And therefore, that's not classed as um, a recoverable target. So we actually determine that we only record recoverable targets. So the detection rate is way out into the 90%. That is confirmed on the ground. So in the video, you saw us conduct a wide area search technique. This is where the handler has the dog off leash, directs the dog in front of them, covering large areas of ground. And then once the dog has responded, there is the capability to put it onto a 15 foot lead and then work the dog methodically to delineate the perimeter of the subsurface oils. So this would save digging lots of pits to try and delineate the actual spill in the subsurface. So we have the two main techniques. That is the wide area search for rapid detection of subsurface oils. And they can detect surface, but obviously so can a human team, but subsurface oils and then the delineation process. So the utilization of the dogs actually is advantageous in uh, no observed oil type searches where the dogs can cover very large areas with high confidence and low risk and say there's nothing here. So rather than teams having to dig pits every 10 meters and actually um, test the areas to see if there's oil present, the dog will cover 100 percent of that area with his nose and just say there's oil here. 
that allows your more specialized teams to actually concentrate on areas where the dog has said there is oil in this location and not spend a lot of time investigating areas where actually there is no oil present. So one of the biggest uses is actually for the dog to say there is no oil. Um, and in the case of the river spill I spoke about, initially the, there was no idea how far downstream the oil had traveled. So we sent the dogs down 600 kilometers and then worked them up to the point they first started to find the oil. We now know, or the teams now know the extent of the um, spill and could concentrate all their efforts upstream of that location. So then obviously the other use of the canines is to actually search areas and locate those oils, whether they're surface or subsurface. Um, but, and even surface oils, as Rob spoke about, that can be um, higher up outside the shoreline and the dogs can locate that and actually identify the extent at which that oil has been distributed within the location, even if it's not necessarily visual because it's in swamp um, or marshy ground or it's uh, mixed within the vegetation itself that you can't readily see, but obviously a dog can find that through location of its nose. And on the video, um, we mentioned about the data collection. The dog teams are, are trained in data collection, integrated part of the SCAT process. So the dogs wear a GPS collar. The collar itself um, has a handheld unit, which the handler has, and that allows downloading of the tracks to um, provide information regarding where the dog has covered, how, how far it actually covered those areas as well as the handler. And we waypoint any alerts from the dog. So at the end of the uh, search day, that data can all be downloaded into the reports and it gives you an exact profile of what was searched, how fast it took, speed of the dog, um, but also the waypoints of all its alerts, and then obviously the record of every alert and what was there as a result. And that data collection comes part of the actual team integration that we spoke about. So it's not just the canine and a handler. The canine handler are part of the canine SCAT team, as we term it, um, and the SCAT team lead, a SCAT team lead is actually trained in the utilization of canines to integrate them into SCAT operations. So it's an integrated team that provides an added tool in the toolbox, an added service, um, but it's not necessarily that it's just the dog and handler. The idea is the dog and handler provide a in-depth capability to the team lead and actually um, gives them the ability to deploy that tool just as they would any other type of uh, survey tool, but obviously this one is highly effective and efficient. As the video said, we imprint on a variety of odors, and what we've proven is the dogs can deploy and detect hydrocarbon products that they've never been imprinted on because the generalization from one hydrocarbon to another actually exists in the field. If possible, we like to calibrate the dog team on day one. This gives us two advantages. One, it allows the dog to understand exactly what we're looking for, although it's not required. And two, it gives the client confidence that the dog can actually find what we're looking for. And then our teams are certified under the International Canine Spill and Leak Detection Association. This is an association that we started for the reason of offering clients a, a certification process to give you confidence that the dogs that you're actually um, utilizing are ones are, are capable of doing the job in the field. So um, we do have a memorandum of agreement with OSRL and the idea is that if you were to conduct them for a survey, that OSRL will actually conduct the initial uh, tasking criteria response and then contact Sharon Canine for the capability to deploy canines within that response and obviously offer that support. So at that point, uh, that's been a very high level overhead cover of what we've done and where we are at this point. There is ongoing research, which you know, um, will be released again in the next few weeks and onwards because we are doing other research that's ongoing, less COVID-19 unfortunately has delayed some of that. 
with some universities. So that's going to be released as well. But um, I'm open to question and I'll hand it back to the team. Thanks very much, Paul. Really appreciate it. It was very interesting. Um, and like Paul said, we we'll to open up now for any questions or comments. But thank you very much for your attention. Just having a look in the chat Okay. That doesn't seem to be any questions there. Mandy, have you seen any come through? No. The no, reason there's no questions is because it says that only meeting organisers and presenters can um, can chat. Ah, interesting. Okay. You have to Thank ask you. the team owner to make you a member. It's one of those idiosyncrasies of teams. Thank you for that. Sorry, I, I didn't introduce myself. It's Simon Button. BP. Hi, Simon. Hi, Simon. Um, a very interesting presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll just stick out there. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting, uh, but I'm very interested in your volunteer program. Um, I, I missed the bit. I take it you've got to go to the website for that. Yes. No, you can you can contact us directly if you if you wish. Um, I can get your contact details from Mandy later on, and I can connect with you outside of this, and we can um, we can share what we're up to and, and uh, the progress we're making. But yeah, it'd be very interesting to get some uh, perspective from our members. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Does anybody else want to raise anything on audio, seeing as the chat function is unfortunately not working? Oh, we have one here from Justina. Uh, how portable is the service around the world? Okay. I guess you're relating back to the canine scat for that question. Um, Paul, would you like to answer this one? Or Rob? Yeah, I can take that. So... Um I'm based in the U.S. As a, and we do have teams here that are certified and based in the U.S. And like I said, we have traveled to Canada, which, although, you know, geographically, it's not that far away. But actually, it's no different from flying to a lot of other countries in that we have to conduct the same health screening protocols as we would fly in to a lot of other countries. There are specific restrictions in some countries as to what the dogs require. To a Reagan country and our teams are actually vaccinated and ready for deployment to the majority of countries as available. Now some countries have specific requirements which we may not be able to meet in a 24 hour 48 hour timeline and then we're going to have to obviously work with the veterinary staff etc and the deploying team and see what is the timeline for deployment of a canine. Having said that the idea of the International Canine Spill and Leak Association is to establish teams more globally, and that then gives a more global deployment capability. Um, but, you know, the teams are deployable. It does take 24 hours to get the veterinary process completed unless it's a drive deployment within the United States or within the country which um, has oil detection canines. And we do deploy through flights quite often. Um, obviously, COVID restrictions has, has caused problems with that, but it is possible to deploy the dogs. And the ultimate aim would be to have a more established global reach of canine teams so that they can deploy more locally or certainly regionally. Hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. Yep, Ace, thank you in the chat. Perfect. Uh, is there any other questions at all? Uh, have you experienced I, customs or import issues with regards to the canines? Again, that's going to go back to you, to you, Paul. Yeah, no, and actually I've, through my service and beyond, I have flown all over the world. Um, with dogs and more recent time, obviously up to Canada and I have gone to Germany uh, with dogs. And, 
you know, nowadays people do travel a lot more with dogs, even in the dog show world and dog obedience and type things. And selling and dealing dogs is now a worldwide um, commerce. So I haven't personally and there hasn't been a lot of um, chatter, if you like, within the community of particular issues. Obviously, just like any traveller, you might come across little um, problems when you get to a country. But as lo- I have a service actually where once I'm put on standby for deployment, I go into that service and it tells me all the requirements that country has to actually get in with the dog. And remember, these are also certified. And um, some people actually recognize the fact that they are certified working dogs. So they're given a slightly higher status than pets traveling or something like that. But personally, no. And we do do those background checks before we even travel and ensure that we are covered. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think I might have cut someone off trying to ask a question via audio. Or was that the same person that uh, had written the, the question? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, James. It was me. It's Tessa. I'm calling from Shell. Um, I thought that K9 scat presentation was really interesting and some of the facts you have are amazing um so looking forward to hearing more of the results as they come out um in the next couple of weeks in terms of access to the service i suppose from a member's perspective is this something that we would uh, could gain through osrl or i mean i know it's probably not included um in terms of the services we offer uh, we have at the moment rob do you want to pick this one up yeah, sure. Hi, Tessa. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you? Good. Yeah. Um, so the agreement that we have with uh, with Paul at Shire on K9 is it's not part of our service level agreement. So it is basically an MOU that we have with with Paul. Um, one might describe it as a best endeavours. So um, during a, uh, early days of a spill, if we think there is potential for oil to become submerged on sandy shorelines, etc., then we would have that conversation with, with the member, um, let them know that we have this capability that can dovetail into our, into our overall SCAT um, uh, program and, and, and take it from there. And then we would obviously have a, a conversation with Paul to talk about the, the specific scenario, the country and, and uh all the issues regarding a specific country and the operations getting in and around with with the dogs that Paul's described already. So that essentially is it, 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 how it stands in a nutshell. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that, Rob. No problem. Ah, An internal question. Are there any limitations to the canine workloads? Um, yeah, I mean, there are limitations just like any other technique that you use in a survey. And where there's going to be one of those, in particular, we're talking about heat, um, because obviously the dogs are very active in their survey technique. Then if it's particularly hot and more importantly, humid, then the dogs will need breaks and rehydration. They do need temperature checks and keep the, the handler must keep an eye on them, etc. So. Um, climatic conditions is one of the things we look at as a general rule then we're looking at the dog teams can work around 40 to 50 minutes per hour 10 minutes rest for about four hours and then they need a longer rest period and then can continue and normally we work the dogs around six or eight hours a day having said that you know it's not much different from actually a human scat team In response to climatic conditions, we do have a matrix which allows us to look at the heat index, um, look to temperature and humidity, and then determine how long we can work a dog and what protocols we have to put in place. Again, very similar to the human type element. So in that case, you know, it's it's the local climatic conditions, the terrain and the handler's experience and knowledge that's actually going to dictate the workload but also the handler then has the capability to discuss that with the team lead and say look you know this is what I can do based on what I'm seeing in front of me right now under these climates we'll work for instance 30 minutes then we'll take 10 minutes rest etc and that allows the team lead to plan the survey day hope that answers the question 
think so. I think, um, like you suggested, Paul, you know, it wouldn't be too far different from the human factor. Um, within Ursarel, we have our uh, hot weather working uh, guidance um, that stipulate working conditions and such. So, yeah, I can't imagine they'd be too far astray from each other. Um, just got another question. Uh, just out of curiosity, are there certain dog breeds that are better for oil detection? Well, there's certain breeds better for detection um, because innately they hold the characteristics that we're looking for. Predominantly, we use Labradors and I have a Springer Spaniel for the oil detection. One of the limitations actually is the transportation of dogs on air flights. So because of the kennel size, I tend to go for smaller breeds because that allows me a lot more scope in getting a portable kennel onto a flight to deploy with because there are restrictions on sizes of kennels. Um, also, if you're doing river banks like high eroding banks, heavy vegetation, etc., it's so much easier with a small dog that can get in and out under vegetation in these hard um, to reach places on um, riprap, etc., than for a large dog to try and do that. So generally, I prefer those sporting breeds for the detection capability, but also you know, they're smaller to get on small deployable boats if you're deploying by boat or helicopter. Um, they're easier to carry over rough areas. So you know, there's a lot of advantages with these smaller breeds that some of the larger breeds like German Shepherds, etc., might not have. And being stereotypical, but in some respects, Again, these smaller breeds can go longer during uh, the day in heat, etc., than necessarily a bigger dog. So I do prefer those gun dog type breeds, um, but that's not to say other breeds couldn't do this. But certainly there's breeds you wouldn't deploy onto a spill response because they would not be able to integrate into teams. They'd just be too big to get on the small boats or helicopters or uh, get onto the rip wrap, etc. Super, thank you. Uh, I can't see any other questions coming in. Okay. Just give another moment in case anything comes in, but I think we're pretty much there. Well, thank you again for coming, everyone, and joining us today. And thank you, presenters. Um, that was a really interesting um, webinar.